Good morning, everyone. Do you want to get started? I'm sure people will be drifting in. Um, so welcome, and thank you all for coming. Uh, I promised uh, some of you door prizes, but I lied about that. So uh, no special gifts on the way out, but ho hopefully you'll learn something. Uh, what's interesting about this talk for me is for the last 20 years, I've not given a talk without slides. We always give talks with slides. So uh, I feel a little naked up here without slides. So I feel like Abbott and Costello, Abbott without Costello. The older folks in the room remember Abbott and Costello. And I bring them up because you should also remember their old skit, Who's on First? Remember that skit? Well, a lot of medicine, unfortunately, is like who's on first. <clears throat> it's very confusing. You hear one thing, you hear another thing, and it's not so clear. And so the story about the hot and cold truth about menopause is not so clear either. So if I promise you not to tell any uh, bad menopause jokes, you guys promise not to shoot the messenger, OK? <laughs> I'm just giving you the, the facts as we know them. And if we don't know them, I'll, I'll give you that too. So this is a story uh, that really, you know, like a lot of things in medicine, it, there's a pendulum. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, the pendulum used to be all the way out here before the year 2000, 2001. And then this study came out, the Women's Health Initiative came out in about 2001, and the pendulum went all the way to the other side. Neither one of those positions is correct. And so now we're somewhere in the middle here. And uh, so that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, and there are two men in the room. <laughs> we think they're men. Um, and they're both OBGYNs. Uh, the gentleman behind the other gentleman is the chairman of OBGYN at Beth Israel. That's Arnold Freeman. And in front of him is uh, Michael Berman, who runs the obstetrical service at Beth Israel. And they have promised not to heckle, throw things, or <laughs> tell me I'm fully you know what. So, um, so a little basic science, and then we'll get into the meat of this. But I think it's important to understand a little bit of the basic science. So um, the female hormones, uh, specifically estrogen, are made in three places. They're made in the ovary, in the adrenal gland, and actually fat cells make estrogen. And there are three estrogens, estradiol, estrone, and estriol. And that's going to be important because when we talk a little later about bioidentical hormones, the fact that there are three estrogens is important to that story. <clears throat> the strongest estrogen is estradiol, and that is made in the ovary. Um, Postmenopausal women make mostly, because the ovary stops making estradiol, has mostly estrone, because again, fat cells in the adrenal gland make some estrogen. Uh, and in pregnancy, interestingly, uh, the most dominant hormone is estriol. Now, estradiol, as far as potency, is a lot more potent than the other two. But the other, two's, the other two, when you're postmenopausal, there are more circulating levels of the other two. Um, and just to sort of go back a little, because uh, it's important also, I'm going to talk a little about birth control pills. So birth control pills have been around for a very long time. And the estrogen in birth control pills is ethanol estradiol. So it's estradiol, like what the ovary makes. But the problem is estradiol gets broken down in the stomach. So to get it past the stomach, they added this ethanol group. And that gets it through the stomach. Every birth control pill in the world has ethanol estradiol in it. The difference in birth control pills, and this goes back also a little bit to the hormone story, is the dose of the ethanol estradiol, how it's given, and the progesterone. So estrogen in the uterus makes the lining grow, and progesterone prevents the lining from growing. So birth control pills have a combination of both, and depending on the combination, uh, creates the environment in the uterus so that you don't bleed. Um, and so part of the hormone replacement story also is the story about estrogen and progesterone. So the estrogen in every birth control pill is exactly the same. The progesterones are a little different, and that's where all the marketing comes in. 
And so when a birth control pill company says our pill does this or that, it's really because of the progesterone in the pill. And as an interesting side story, <clears throat> there was a scientist at Orthonovum back in the 50s who was a devout Catholic who actually invented the birth control pill. <laughs> and um, he thought two things were going to happen. He thought that the pope, whoever the pope was back then, was going to make him a saint for figuring out how to provide birth control and still be in the confines of the church. And he thought he'd win a Nobel Prize for coming up with a birth control pill. Well, two things did happen to him. The church excommunicated him. And Orthonovum fired him. And the reason is, and this is very important, the original birth control pill had estrogen and progesterone in it, and it was meant to be taken every day. And when they did an, uh, market analyses with groups of women, the thought that they didn't bleed and clean themselves and menstruate every month uh, was very foreign, and so they all rejected the pill. So he got fired because it was a disaster failure. And then somebody figured out that if you give the pill for 21 days and stop it for a few days, you'll bleed every month. But that bleed, interestingly, is not a period. It's an artificial bleed to make women feel like they're doing whatever they think they need to be doing and making them feel like they're getting a period. So I tell that story because the, some of the early hormone replacement pills followed the same thing. So the concept was you were going to transition into menopause and still feel, quote, young because you would still be menstruating every month. Okay, so the early pills were more about the marketing than the science because they wanted women to buy the pills, which is what actually happened with the early birth control pills. <clears throat> um, so one last bit of biology and then we'll move on. So uh, estrogen is a steroid hormone. Hormones are something that's made somewhere in the body, travels somewhere else and does some work. That's the definition of a hormone. And um, so what's interesting to most of the women in this room, maybe not the men, um, everything starts out as cholesterol and it goes through a lot of steps. One of the intermediate hormones is testosterone, or I should say androgens. And you go from androgens to estrogen and progesterone. So the end uh, steroid hormone is the female hormones and the male hormones are the sort of the intermediate steps, which is probably how most of you in this room feel already. <laughs> Um, okay, so the real story. So before 2000, uh, and these two gents in the room and, and all the older, oh, Keith's here too. Oh, and, oh, we got more men. Oh, good. So if a riot breaks out, you guys will help me. Um, so um, before 2000 about, uh, everybody who was, who was a practicing OBGYN thought that the hormone replacement pill was the universal pill that everybody should take. Every post every woman who walked into a gynecologist who had even a, any thought of anything, a hot flash, a mood swing, anything, the gynecologist would say, you need hormone replacement. And we would all tell everybody, it is great. And um, again, without the slides, I need my notes. It's good for mood, sense of well-being, memory, hot flashes, uh, libido, somebody say sex, <laughs> sex, 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 uh, heart, skin, uh, vaginal lubrication, hair, joints, and depression. So women would come in and, and this was the universal, you got to take this pill because we're going to fix all these things. And that, you know, I have to say myself, I would say that to women too. And um, so we gave the pill out to everybody. And um, the interesting thing about the depression is uh, most people who go to a, a psychiatrist or psychologist are women, and most of the women who go are between 45 and 55. That's just the st uh, statistic. And what was said back in the days of sort of the male chauvinistic, you know, jokes about PMS and hot flashes and all that other stuff was that, you know, women who were 50, you know, they were looking in the mirror and, you know, they weren't liking what they were seeing and their husbands were whatever and they, were, they had sick parents and their kids were making them nuts. And so they'd go to the psychiatrist and get 
some pills to make them feel better. But in reality, what's happening in the perimenopause is uh, the estrogens that are produced in your ovaries uh, created sort of a stable platform upon which, you know, it was part of your thermostatic setting, so to speak. And um, PMS is the time of the month when you're a menstruating woman, when your hormones are fluctuating and it can make you feel uncomfortable in a lot of ways. Perimenopause is basically PMS over months or years <laughs> in some women. And it's because, um, so now I have a psychiatrist in the room. <laughs> That's Dr. Debbie Marin, who's uh, one of the major psychiatrists at Mount Sinai. Uh, she treats me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so you came in at a great time. So, um, so a lot of women would go and they, and, you know, they get pills, and, and, but the gynecologist would say, you need estrogen because that's going to help you, not an antidepressant. So even back then, there was sort of like a battle between the psychiatrist and the gynecologist. But we universally thought, this is the magic pill. Now, um, I'll say something that is related to this, but speaks to all of medicine. There is no magic pill, there never has been one, there never will be one. So anybody selling you a magic pill, don't buy it. The, everything has a side effect and a downside, and it's just you know basically whether you're willing to accept whatever the downside is for the upside. And I was just telling uh, somebody here earlier, um, you're more likely to die in an automobile accident than anything I'm going to tell you today. And yet we all drive without thinking twice about it because it's part of our lives. So we make choices and everybody you know, has to decide basically, not to sound morbid, but how you want to die and how you want to live. So that's what this is really about. It's about a balance. So, um, so basically, the thought was back then, one, si one size fits all. Everybody gets the same pill. It universally helps everybody. Don't call me. You'll be great in a couple of weeks. And that's the end of the story. Um, and back to the sex, if, the, if you still were doing OK, but you wanted a little more oomph, then you took a little testosterone. And that would you know, sort of add the extra bounce on the uh, sexual side. Um, so with a little, with hormone replacement, mostly Prempro, which was the number one selling pill, and a little testosterone, there was a pill called Estratest, which was basically Prempro with a little testosterone in it. The world was at peace and everybody was happy. And then the WHI came out. So this is a study that came out in, I think, 2000, 2001. And you all remember this. Um, there was a headline that, you know, hormone replacement causes breast cancer. So within basically one week, 90% of people taking hormone replacement stopped. And uh, for those of us who were gynecologists at the time, the phones were ringing off the hook. There was actually a guy at Sinai, one of the OB, uh, OBGYNs, who actually had a phone message because he just got tired of talking to all his patients. <laughs> and he said, if you're calling about hormone replacement, stop it, and we'll talk in three months. <laughs> he didn't even... So, you know, it got, it got really crazy. It really got crazy. And, um, but what was interesting is a lot of those women within three months actually went back on the pills because they liked them, they needed it. And so, again, the pendulum swung a little too far. And um, so it, it was over here. It crashed over to the other side. And then all of a sudden, you know, people had to take a deep breath and say, well, let's really analyze the data. So let me talk to you a little about this study. It was the largest study undertaken by the U.S. government up until that point, and probably still is the largest study. They enrolled 30,000 women in this study, and there were three arms. There was an arm that was the control group. They did nothing. There was an arm that took Premarin, uh, Prempro, which was estrogen and progesterone, uh, and there was an arm that only took estrogen. The reason you take the progesterone is if you take estrogen alone and you have a uterus, you can cause uterine cancer. So the progesterone would block the uterine cancer. So anybody with a uterus took estrogen and progesterone, and anybody without a uterus could take the estrogen alone. So um, another male. <laughs> um, 
So um, basically what happened is the end point of the, they had some endpoints in the study, but along the way they did a statistical analysis and showed that there was a, there was a statistically different, a statistically significant difference in the PremPro group in breast cancer after three years. There was a higher rate of breast cancer. Um, and so they stopped the study. So the PremPro group stopped the study, but the estrogen only group went on. But the articles in the paper were after they stopped the study for that um, statistical increase in the amount of breast cancer in the PremPro group. Um, so here's how that study went. In the 10,000 women who took nothing, there was at that point 130 breast cancers. So 130 women out of 10,000 got breast cancer. In the PremPro group, it was 138. So there were eight more breast cancers per 10,000 women over the control. So, um, so when women say to me, you know, I took estrogen, I got breast cancer, still 130 out of the 138 were going to get it even if they didn't take estrogen. So, the, so, so everybody went nuts. They stopped the study. And then, you know, sort of there was the group that said, well, wait a minute. You know, uh, maybe that's not a fair assessment. That's a, that's a statistical difference, but is it really a clinical difference? And this is where the fighting started uh, getting crazy. Um, but we'll come back to that. So um, they, con they continued the study for the five years. And what really got everybody crazy, crazy, crazy is the group that only took estrogen, there was 123 breast cancers. The control group had 130. So if you take estrogen alone, the conclusion is it's breast protective. Think about that. So everybody tells you not to take estrogen, but the women who only took estrogen actually did better than the control group. Um, so in that study, what they came up with is, uh, and again, part of what got everybody to stop the study, I'm sorry, stop taking hormone replacement, was in their study there was an increased risk of coronary heart disease, coronary artery disease. There was an increased risk of stroke, an increased risk of blood clots, and again, an increased risk of breast cancer. Okay, so all of a sudden now, hormone replacement is really bad. And so... The conversations in the office were now about, you know, why were we taking all these things that do all these bad things? Um, but here's the critical piece. So I spoke to you a little about birth control pills and dosing and whatever. So the question is, is this about the dose? Is it about the actual estrogen and progesterone in the pill? Is it about when you take it in your life? Um, and also, it's a question of whether it's treating something or preventing something. Okay, everybody got that? So dose, which, pill, which uh, estrogen and progesterone is in the pill? Um, dose, which is in the pill, when you take it, and whether it's preventative or treating something. So, um, so here's the problem. The... WHI study, to be able to enroll 30,000 people and either take hormones or not take hormones, they needed women who were not getting hot flashes. Because if they were getting hot flashes and they took the placebo and they didn't get cured, they know they were taking the placebo. And if they were getting hot flashes and they stopped, they knew they were taking something with estrogen in it. So the only way to make it a blinded study so that no one knew what they were doing is they needed women who were not getting hot flashes. So the average age of the patient in the study was 65. The average patient in the study was obese. And 50% of the patients in the study smoked. <laughs> now, I'm going to say something very nasty, but I'm in New York, and hopefully I'm among <laughs> friends. But um, if any of you have gone to Disney World,
other than like marveling at Minnie Mouse and Mickey Mouse and the Magic Kingdom, what is the first impression you all get when you walk through the front gate? Somebody bold enough to answer that? A lot of fat people smoking cigarettes, yelling at their kids. The kids are eating like hot dogs and cotton candy. The average American is, the average woman in America is obese. And so the critical thing here is this study was done on basically obese 65-year-olds who smoke. And then, and the problem is, is you start hormone replacement when somebody is 51, 52 and complaining of whatever they're complaining about. So the critics of the WHI study said, well, wait a minute, you, who are we talking about here? I think we're talking about the wrong group. And no one ever said that hormone replacement would cure heart disease. Okay, so everybody got that? So that's where the fight then started. Um, so people started looking at the 45 to 55 year old crowd. <clears throat> And that's the age when, again, people would start taking um, hormone replacement. So again, is it preventative or is it a treatment? So if you get pneumonia, you take penicillin. That's a treatment. Taking penicillin every day as a preventative for pneumonia doesn't work. So we use antibiotics to treat things, not prevent things. You take blood pressure pills to prevent heart attacks. Once you've gotten a heart attack, your doctor doesn't say, take a uh, blood pressure pill. You should have been taking it all along. Interestingly, in the papers, there was this new thing about statins. Everybody see that? That, you know, so again, we, we think that, you know, if, if a cholesterol of 150 is good, then 120 must be better and 100 must be even better than that. So a lot of times, again, back to who's on first, we sometimes confuse ourselves and everybody else. Sorry, I keep doing that. Wake you up. Um, you know, we confuse ourselves because it's not always about the dose. It's sometimes about when you take it and how you take it. Um, so the, the argument then was put forth that it's, it's about timing. And it may be about um, the, the components of the hormone replacement. So there is a gazillion year history of women taking birth control pills, and there is not an increased risk of breast cancer in, in the gazillion women who have taken birth control pills. Um, and in the, again, the WHI, the progesterone in the study was medroxyprogesterone, which is Provera. So again, the, the contra-argument was that it's the Provera, the medroxyprogesterone, that's the evil progesterone. And so the, the argument then, the fight then became timing and possibly what was in the pills. So that's where we sort of got into the mid-2000s as far as studies. Um, so again, the proponents of hormone replacement said that, that um, estrogen is used to treat hot flashes, so that's a treatment. But the argument about all those other things I talked about was more about preventative. So. The fight then was taken to, you know, this argument in the 50-plus-year-olds. So interestingly, a study was done, uh, women between 45 and 55, and it was a study where they took the hormone replacement for five years. And in that study, there was uh, less women died taking the hormone replacement. There were less fractures. There was less diabetes. There was less breast cancer, again, in the, in the uh, estrogen group. There was less colorectal cancer, and there was less endometrial cancer. There was an increased risk of a gallstone. There was an increased risk of a deep vein thrombosis, a clot in your leg, and of stroke. But if you sort of weighed these two together, the benefits of the first group, as far as in your life, outweighed the risks of the second group meaning all the things I listed as positives outweighed in the totality the risks. Um, so clearly taking it around menopause for five years, according to the study, had some benefits. So in that study, 
and it, this is again per thousand patients, there were, they prevented four heart attacks, they prevented five deaths, they prevented six fractures, uh, one and a half breast cancers, 11 women from developing type 2 diabetes, and there were two less colon cancers. There was one more stroke, five more uh, clots, and um, in the estrogen, in the PremPro group, the estrogen and progesterone group, there were six more breast cancers. Has everybody got that? Um, so, first thing you might say to yourself is if, you know, my family doesn't have any history of strokes or blood clots or heart attacks um, and no gallstones, you know, maybe this doesn't apply to me. The reverse is, you know, there's diabetes, uh, there's uh, a history of blood clots, pulmonary emboli, strokes, you know, maybe this is not for me. Um, and then to m make this even more confusing, there is this uh, sort of new entity that came out a number of years ago in medicine called metabolic syndrome. This is a condition where women have diabetes, they're hypertensive, and they're, they have truncal obesity, all you heard about where your fat is. Um, well, it turns out that the fat that you have around your abdomen is bad kind of fat. And the fat that you have every, you know, in your rear end, your thighs, even though you may not like it, that's good fat. Um, and so it depends on what kind of fat you have also. Um, so the new wrinkle in this is you know, the patients in that study. Remember, half were obese. Um, and they smoked, and you know, so maybe some of these patients were those metabolic syndrome patients. So we'll get back to that. Uh, so let's talk a little about heart. We'll go through a couple of different subjects, and then we'll sort of wrap it all up. So heart. Um, so by the time you're 60, and you've developed plaques, so the things that we worry about narrowing your coronary arteries, um, taking estrogen does not dissolve those plaques. So if you're 65 and you have coronary artery disease um, and narrowing of your arteries and you take estrogen, it's not going to help that. The horse is already out of the barn, okay? So that's physiologically what's going on and that's why in the Women's Health Initiative, the estrogen didn't help the heart. Uh, but if you look at the 50 to 60 year old group, a whole different story comes out. Uh, wh when they went back to the WHI study and they looked at those women, the women on estrogen's calcium scores, from, do all you know what a calcium score is? It's another sort of marker for heart disease. You can go in and find out what your calcium score is, and if it's above a certain amount, that means you have a higher probability of, of having uh, heart disease. So they went back and did the calcium scores, and it turned out the women on hormone replacement was lower. They've done other studies, and they've shown that women uh, doing angiograms who are on hormone replacement have better coronary arteries than the women who are not on estrogen in their 50s. Everybody remember, in your 50s. So um, basically, if you're between 50 and 60, and you take uh, hormone replacement, it, according to these studies, is good for your heart. If you're between 60 and 70, it probably has no benefit. And if you're over 70, then you start getting into the risk because of the, your age sort of catches up with the stuff that happens to you, strokes and heart attacks and blood clots. And so over 70, it's probably not a good idea. Now the question you might ask, and by the way, anybody can ask a question anytime. Um, are we talking about starting hormones at 70? Or if you've been taking them from 50 to 70? That's another uh, question that's very hard to answer. Okay, so when I say 70, what I mean for this study is if you start hormone replacement at age 70, and honestly, and all the GYNs in the room can answer to this, um, you would never start hormone replacement in somebody who's 70 anyway. So it's kind of a moot point, but for the purposes of the study. Um, 
So progesterone. <clears throat> so in the WHI, it was the estrogen progesterone group, and the progesterone was uh, medroxy progesterone. So people then said maybe it's that, or maybe it's they're taking too much progesterone. So a lot of people, myself included, started giving out hormone, hormone replacement in a way where you mostly took estrogen and periodically took progesterone. And so arbitrarily, people said, take estrogen every day and every three months take progesterone. Some people said every six months take progesterone. Um, some people said don't take any progesterone and every year do a biopsy of the lining of the uterus to make sure nothing's going on. But the, the pendulum swung towards minimizing the progesterone exposure if you're going to take hormone replacement. <coughs> Excuse me. And that's sort of where we are right now. Um, So cognitive function. Um, in the WHI, yes? Oh, sorry, can you, can you just backtrack a little for uh, those of us who are in our 40s and give a little bit of a timeline of, of averages as to when certain hormonal changes start taking place? And you started even talking about women in their early 50s. Just sort of, there's a range of women sure. losing their period and sure. stopping. So let me, what you mean by perimenopause? Great question, sorry. So the average woman in this country goes through menopause at 51. And the sort of the range is, uh, you know, the two standard, two standard deviation thing is, is 48, 49 to 55. So menopause by definition is the cessation of ovarian, func ovarian estrogen function. The ovary doesn't die, it just stops making estrogen. Perimenopause is this vague window of time between normal cycling hormones and then this. So there's this window of time that could be one month wide or it could be 10 years where you're in this sort of, you know, pms -y kind of thing where your hormones are all over the place. And, and what I like to say to my patients is if you put, and I, we have it here, you put 50 women in a room which I always think is a little scary, but if you do that uh, and you ask them, you know, what's your story, each one of those women will have 50 different stories. And the reason is, is I mentioned that estrogen affects a lot of different things. I mentioned like 10 things. And for you math majors in here, if you take those 10 things and give them, a, you know, a, a 0 to 10, like, you know, 1 if it's not, if it's really bad, 10 if it's great. If you do that math, there's a trillion combinations of those 10 things times 10. So that's why you, you need to take the trillion in one first person to actually have the same story as somebody else. So everybody has their own story. So, um, and again, the perimenopause can be not existent. There are women who actually go through menopause, maybe some of you in this room were, will raise your hand, who don't even blink, don't even know it, feel happy. And, you know, some women find themselves in gun shops buying semi-automatic weapons <laughs> and looking to really do some damage. Um, and, you know, as I like to say to my patients, uh, you know, if you find yourself eating lunch in the cafeteria by yourself, that's not a good thing. <laughs> if somebody who loves you locks the drawer in the kitchen with the knives in it, that's not a good thing. And if you are thinking of joining the NRA, you should probably call your gynecologist. <laughs> but everybody else is a conversation. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Sort of. Well, I, I think it's interesting that um, I, I recently had gone through a doctor who had a knee replacement, and he said, you know, it's not the fact that you have a knee replacement that you're going to have a problem. Increase in your what? My, having migraines. Okay. Right. So it's the, it's the um, so to, to say this legally so I don't, you know, end up saying the wrong thing and getting sued, you can have headaches for a lot of reasons. But if it's hormonally related, uh, the fluctuating hormones can produce instability in your brain and cause headaches. So, peri so PMS women 
Again, it's the same thing. Some women get headaches when they have PMS, really bad headaches, migraines, the whole thing. And so if you give estrogen to some of those women and stabilize them, they feel better. Now, there are certain kinds of migraines where you get auras, where taking hormones is not good, makes it worse. So it depends on what kind of headache you get. But if you're getting headaches now, it's either because you're entering your 40s and you're technically perimenopausal maybe, uh, or you know you just got a bad job and you're getting headaches. Um, <laughs> um, so, cognitive function. So this is an interesting one. So in the WHI, there was, no, there was actually a, a drop in cognitive function. And again, we're talking about 65-year-olds who um, you know, already have the atherosclerotic disease, and the estrogen is not going to help. But what happens in the 50-year-olds? Again, the preventative as opposed to the treatment argument. Well, they've done studies, and they show that um, women in their 50s on estrogen actually have a little better cognitive function. Now, what's really fascinating about this is, this is a little known fact, but every brain, male and female, has, makes estradiol. Our brains function on estradiol. And in the best way I can describe it is like an oak tree. So estrogen is a fertilizer. Our oak trees are the neurons in your brain. So if you're an oak tree, you want to have a lot of branches with a lot of leaves on it. Um, and what they've sort of found is uh, Alzheimer's is really when the tree dies. It's a different kind of dementia than, than just age-related dementia where the tree gets less branches, less leaves. So dementia is just sort of the tree thinning out, and Alzheimer's is when the tree dies. Estrogen doesn't prevent a tree from dying. So in the WHI, there was no drop in, in Alzheimer's in the study. But uh, estrogen is a hormone made in the brain, and it actually acts as a fertilizer. So in your 50s, estrogen helps those trees, those oak trees and the limbs and the leaves do well. So again, in the 50s, cognitive function seemed to be a little better on estrogen replacement. And they actually uh, did studies, uh, there's something called a functional MRI. They, they, I don't know if there are any dog lovers in the audience, but there was an article in the Times a few weeks ago about they put these dogs into MRI machines, and they trained it. It wasn't cruel. They trained the dogs to be able to sit there and not go nuts with the rattling. They're well trained as opposed to a lot of people. And they did, they did functions on the brain, and they saw that uh, dogs actually because of the way blood flows, uh, when they, they have emotions. That was this dog study. That's for my wife, who's a dog person. <laughs> but they also put perimenopausal women in those MRI machines. They weren't trained to sit there. Um, but they did show that in certain parts of the brain related to cognition, there was increased flow in women who were on hormone replacement. So, in the 50s, on hormone replacement, you get increased flow to the cognitive and the mood areas of your brain if you're taking estrogen. A um, couple of little ones, UTIs, urinary tract infections. Women taking vaginal estrogen have less urinary tract infections because estrogen is one of the hormones that actually strengthens the tissues of the urethra and lower bladder and makes them a little healthier, and it prevents bacteria from swimming up. So women on hormone replacement have less um, urinary tract infections. Skin, yes? We're gonna get to sex. <laughs> we'll get to that. Um, so estrogen makes skin a little more elastic um, and more hydrated. So if your skin has more water in it, you have less wrinkles. And if it's a little more elastic, it's less wrinkly. So women on estrogen will have uh, better skin. Um, estrogen affects hair. Um, what's interesting about hair is some women, when they're pregnant, their hair falls out. Hair go through hair, growing hair. This is a toupee. Growing hair um, um, goes through cycles, 
And for some reason, when, when women have hormonal shifts, the cycles get out of sync and women can start losing a lot of hair. So it happens in pregnancy sometimes and it happens around menopause. So one of the things that can help your hair around that time, if it's starting to fall out in clumps, is to take some estrogen. Again, it doesn't work long term, but it does work. Interestingly, women with uh, joint issues, uh, there's a f uh, one study showed a 40% drop in uh, joint pain on women in their 50s with hormone replacement. So it's, it's good for your joints. And one thing that you don't want to hear is uh, it has no effect on weight. So the first question everybody asks an OBGYN when they are given a birth control pill or a hormone replacement is, will I gain weight? And the answer is no. Now, what can happen is you can start eating more and you will gain weight because you're now happy that you're not having all these other problems. So you go out and you eat a lot of good dinners and lo and behold, you gain more weight. So it's not a direct thing of the pill that makes you gain weight, it's your life changes. So now let's get to androgens. Um, so the, yes. It's very good for your bones. We're going to get there. Right. So, the, 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 so again, if you continue to take estrogen through menopause, um, you will protect your bones. If you start taking estrogen five or six years after you finish menopause, then you've lost that protective window. There are other things we use, but the bone story is a very complicated story in and of itself. It's a, it's a two-hour mishmash like this, and it's not so clear. But estrogen is good for your bones. So it's good for your bones, your joints, your skin, a lot of general things. Um, so again, a whole nother conversation, but gynecologists used to routinely take out ovaries in women who needed surgery if they were over 50. You know, it would be, be the usual, you know, listen, honey, you're not having any more kids in a very, you know, uh, not nice way of saying it, and, and the woman would go, okay, and they'd have their ovaries lopped out. Um, but the postmenopausal ovary does produce a little amount of testosterone, and so the question is, what function does that have? And so now the new thinking is not to take out ovaries in postmenopausal women for operating unless they have, you know, some reason to, family history of ovarian cancer, what have you. But um, the testosterone story is there are several testosterones, uh, androgens, I keep saying testosterone, I'm sorry. Be more precise, it's androgens. There's DHEA, DHEAS, which, you know, DHEA you can buy in the store. Androstene dione, testosterone, and dihydrotestosterone. So the predominant hormone in men is testosterone. Um, half of it is made in the ovary, half of it is made in the uh, adrenal gland in women. Androstene dione, again, half and half, and for the DHEA, 50% is made in the adrenal gland, 20% is made in the ovary, and 30% is converted in the peripheral tissue to, uh, uh, into androstene dione. Um, the DHEA, interestingly, over the course of a woman's lifetime, decreases slowly over time. So at age 70 compared to age 20, it's about 20%. So you have 20% of your DHEA when you're 70 that you had when you were 20, but it doesn't go like this. It just goes gradually down. It just over your lifetime, it, it decreases. The amount of testosterone made in the ovary stays the same throughout someone's lifetime. So the postmenopausal ovary makes the same amount of testosterone as the premenopausal ovary. Um, so the question is, you know, what is the purpose of that estrogen? Um, so a little mythology. Um, and I'm going to digress a second. A lot of the studies done on everything we use is, have been done on men, and then they sort of extrapolated into women. If you were next door listening to the heart conversation, you would know that a lot of the stuff we use has been tried in men, and they just figure women are just smaller men, so they'll give them a smaller <laughs> dose. Um, so a lot of what we do is, is about what I'm about to say, which is, you know, men with more testosterone seem to be more sexually active and more you know what. 
chasing their girlfriends and wives around. So people think, well, then, if it works for men, it must be good for women. So if maybe women should take more testosterone, too, and that'll, make that, that'll increase their sexuality. And the second thing that sort of goes along with that is, you know, the concept that, well, if the ovary's making testosterone, it has to be making it for some reason, and it has to be something good associated with that. So if you put those two things together, you come up with the brilliant idea that women should be taking more testosterone. Remember we, I said before, if one is good, two is better. We do that a lot in our lives. You know, the doctor says take one vitamin a day, you take two because you figure it's twice as good. You know, we all have our own little stories about that, not necessarily vitamins, but that's how we think. Um, <clears throat> so this is very important. There has been no study, no, 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 no study that has ever shown that increasing testosterone in a normal functioning woman increases her sexuality. Okay? There are a lot of people selling testosterone out there, but it has never been shown. And in fact, the FDA does not approve the use of testosterone creams for that purpose. Um, so how about testosterone and brain power? So this is a really tricky subject. So do you think men are smarter than women and, and less moody or dumber and more moody? <laughs> this is an easy crowd. What do you say, Garfield? No comment. Um, so I think you all agree that men are more moody and less smart. So that may be due to the testosterone. No one really knows. But what we do know is that androgens uh, lower your good cholesterol, the HDL, and raise your overall cholesterol. So that's not a good thing. And, you know, when you read about uh, men in, or women in sports taking, you know, hormones, it's really androgen-based stuff. And um, they may perform better for the short period of time that they're doing their sport, but a lot of them get really sick afterwards. So... Um, it's, it's a really dangerous kind of drug to be playing around with. And, um, and so testosterone and bone, again, you think men have bigger bones than women. It doesn't really help women taking testosterone as far as bone strength. Um, <clears throat> so back to the science. Um, there, there is a condition called androgen deficiency. Uh, it's listed, you know, in the textbooks. And... Um, but there are no biochemical criteria. The data that is, has been produced is not age-related, because as we said, age is important. And uh, serum androgen levels are not an independent predictor of sexual function. So no one's ever shown that. So it, the point is, is somebody comes in and says, you know, I need a little more boost in the bedroom. And you say, okay, we're going to measure your testosterone level, and then we're going to give you a cream, and then you know, we'll see that it goes up and blah, blah, blah. No one has ever you know, correlated those two, and no one has ever shown that increasing your testosterone actually increases your sexuality. Um, the only time it works, and this is, again, why we have the market, is women who are premenopausal, who have their ovaries taken out, sometimes go through a profound sort of hormonal shock and their libido goes down, the sexuality goes down, and if you give them, this is very important, super physiologic doses of testosterone, they'll get better. But again, testosterone is a very scary thing, and no one has ever measured all the other things that happen when you take super physiologic doses of the testosterone. So, you know, again, I caution everyone that if you're thinking you're going to get the boost, you have to take really high doses and that's really dangerous in a lot of other ways that have, not even begin, that have not even begun to be measured. So be very cautious about that. DHEA is sold in the stores as a, you know, sort of an androgen boost. S studies have shown no benefit in women. Um, there is a drop, again, throughout your lifetime. I was saying from, you know, a 70% drop. But no one seems to have found any reason why you need more of it later in life to help you in any way. So... Again, 
the whole thing is this superphysiologic dose. Now, here's the interesting thing. You read this study, okay? Superphysiologic doses do help. So they did a study, and so they took women, and they, and they had three uh, sexual encounters a month. That was the average of the women in the study. And then they gave them these superphysiologic doses of testosterone, and they increased the four <laughs> events in a month. Now, you're all laughing because we all think that, you know, you take this stuff and you're going to be chasing your husband around the bedroom every night, and the guy's going to say, I can't do it anymore, you know? Eh. It goes from three to four, and that was the big bounce in the study. So, again, you know, you got to be a little careful about reading the studies and where you want to go. Um, there was actually a pharmaceutical company called, uh, that put out a product, uh, Libby Gel, and they actually did two trials because they were making the testosterone uh, gel. And neither one of their studies, this is the pharmaceutical company, neither one of their studies showed any benefit. So if a pharmaceutical company who's making the product tells you it's not working, that's a pretty powerful thing. Um, so let's talk a little about hot flashes. We're almost done. Yes. I'll, I'll, that's how I'm going to wrap this up. So I'll, I'll get back to your question. Well, one other question that yes. I want to ask you, which is, you know, we talk about medications, hormonal, all sorts of other medications. What about any sort of alternative therapy? I'm, I'm going to, that was her question. I'm going to come back to that. <clears throat> so hot flashes. 50% of women stop before menopause. 80% uh, stop in one year. And about 10%. Uh, still have them in their 70s. So my mother, who was 75, she's passed away, but she used to call me yelling at me that she was still getting hot flashes like it was my fault. <laughs> so, um, ma. Anyway, um, but they are worse if you smoke, if you're heavy. Actually, they decrease if you, and we all know this, the increased physical activity decreases them. But in studies, they've shown that women who are in higher socioeconomic classes, classes and who have higher earning, you know, make more money, actually have less hot flashes than the reverse. <laughs> so if you want to uh, fix your hot flashes, go get a PhD <laughs> and make a lot of money. Um, so um, let's, let me just say one last point, and then I'll wrap it up. So when we go back and look at all this data about the negative side effects, it turns out, and this is all new data, that that metabolic group, the metabolic syndrome group, is the group in the WHI study who had the increased risk of everything. So I go back to Disney World and whether a, you know, uh, soul cycle, spin class, yoga eating, tofu eating New Yorker who's 52 is the same as the woman from Indiana who doesn't do any of that stuff? And the answer is no, they are not the same. So you can taper this to the audience you're talking to. Um, so alternatives. There are uh, plant things like uh, soy that make uh, phytoestrogens, which are similar to estrogens. And again, I, I said before that there are 10 things that affect estrogen effects and a scale of 0 to 10. And some of these other products um, can work. If, you're, if your hot flashes are 1 or 2 out of 10, then eating more soy may help. Taking black cohash may help. Um, but if you're a 9 out of 10, it's not going to get you there. So the only thing that really gets you there is, the, taking, the, is taking estrogen. Um, so that's the alternative route. Um, the better alternative route would be to exercise more, uh, eat better, um, and lose some weight because that all seems to work in uh, improving mood in general and the hot flashes. Uh, back to the 
bioidentical. So I, I didn't mention bioidentical, and I'll finish with when you start. So somebody brilliantly, uh, and I wish it was me, because the person who figured this out made gazillions of dollars, came up with the term bioidentical. If you look in a medical textbook, there is no, you can't find bioidentical in any <laughs> medical textbook. It is a completely fictitious term. And what somebody brilliantly figured out was that, remember we said there were three estrogens, estradiol, estrone, and estriol? So somebody figured out that if you compounded, because you can't buy this, no pharmaceutical company makes this, if you go to a pharmacist and you say, you know, uh, we're going to take five of that estrone, two of estriol, and three of estradiol, then the concept is you're giving the woman the three estrogens that her body was normally making. And so this company in Minnesota, or wherever they are, uh, figured this all out. And so women ran in droves to get these bioidentical hormones uh, in, the, in these doses. Um, now, there's a couple of problems with that. No one knows what the dose should be of the three. And interestingly, um, you know, if, you, if you're saying I'm 50 now, I felt really good when I was 25, we don't know what the percentage was of each of those things when you were 25 anyway. So it's just some person sitting in a thing going, uh, Mrs. Roth, you still awake? Good. You need... 50 of estradiol, 30 of estrone, and 20 of estriol. Try that for two months. Now, the interesting thing about it is insurance companies don't pay for it, so it's a very lucrative business to be in, the compounding business. And the FDA has actually warned against using these compounded substances because there's no quality control over them. You don't know what you're getting in your compounded thing. Um, and what confuses all this is, you know, when anybody gets any pill, there's a 20% placebo effect, 10 to 20 percent. So you, you rub on, you know, sugar water and 15 percent of people are going to be chasing their husband around the bedroom <laughs> and, you know, think it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. So it, it gets a little confusing. But the FDA does not recommend or actually recommends against taking any compounded substances. Did everybody see that article in the paper about how most of the uh, over-the-counter herbal remedies uh, are you, only 30% of the time you're actually getting what it says on the label? Everybody see that? I mean, it's a little scary what's out there that's not regulated. So, you know, we can argue about the big, bad, you know, drug companies, but to some degree at least they're regulated. Um, so we, we, with the uh, bioidentical, um, your body doesn't know when you put estrogen in your body, however it starts in your body, your bone cell, where estrogen is good, doesn't know whether the, it was a pill, a patch, a cream, a vaginal insertion, an injection. It looks like one of those three things, estrone, estriol, or estradiol. So how you take it, there are reasons for taking it, uh, taking estradiol because it's in the patch, which I'm not going to get into today. But the long story short is, Doing this compounding uh, has never been really shown to be advantageous over anything else, and you could save a lot of money just taking traditional medications. Um, so that's the compounding thing. Did I answer? What was the? Oh, and then to start. So that's how we wrap it up. So to wrap it up, there are two philosophies in hormone replacement. One, there are many, but these are my two. Um, <laughs> So when you start to get symptomatic, the one theory is to start taking the hormones then so you transition through menopause without hitting any walls or buying guns and you don't even go there, okay? You don't even get to the point where somebody says to you, what's wrong with you? You know, you just sort of miss the whole event. So if you want to be one of those people, you know, in your late 40s, you start taking them and you sort of transition. And then when you're you know, through menopause at say 55, so again, that five to 10 year window, um, you've gone through menopause, you're sort of stable and then you slowly wean off the hormones. Theory two is you know, somebody pulls you down from the, you know, the book depository ninth floor with the gun and says, you know, Mary, you really need to, like, get a grip. And then so you start it when somebody becomes really symptomatic. 
Um, I think it's a lot easier to start it when somebody's symptomatic because then they really can buy into it. It's hard to sell something to somebody who's not sure what's going to happen to them. And, it, and, you know, again, less is always more. So if you don't need something, you don't have to take it. So, again, it is heart protective. But if you're 50, 50 years old, you know, everybody in your family lives to 95. You run, you know, 20 miles a week. I don't think that you need heart protection. And so to take it to prevent something that you're not going to get doesn't make sense. Um, so this is where you, you get into the balance. I, I, at least in my private practice, um, I really tend to treat the people who come in complaining of something. And to me, the, the, the line that you cross is quality of life. And I say to patients, if your quality of life today was worse than it was five years ago and you're not doing well, then do something. So patients, you know, professionals come in. They say, you know, I, I, I lecture, uh, you know, I, I run a business, I have to make presentations, and I'm sitting up there, and, you know, I haven't slept in three days, and, and I, I can't concentrate, and, and I couldn't get through my talk. Those people, you know, are telling me that their lives have been affected and they need something. Somebody says, uh, no, I get an occasional hot flash. You know, I, it's not a big deal, and, you know, I'm fine. I mean, what are we treating? So to finish this up, that's where we need to be right now is to be, first of all, let me just say, the final word is clearly not in. So I'm, again, the messenger. There's still more to be learned about hormones. But the reasonable approach today in 2013 is to have a conversation with somebody, hopefully it's your GYN, but somebody knowledgeable, and fine tune what you need to you. So take your whole life in total and figure out what works for you. So if everybody in your family dies of heart disease, um, you know, that's important, and you should figure that into the equation. Um, if everybody in your family gets breast cancer, you know, fit that into your equation. But figure it out for yourself, and there's always risks and benefits to everything. So nothing is for free, and you have to make choices in life. So if you want to drive a car, accept that risk. And if you want to take any medication, realize that there is an upside and a downside, and, and it should be, uh, you know, individualized to you. Yes? And so on the quality of life issue, what's, then why would one want to lean on the medications? Because so if you are in my business, you will find that most people who start hormone replacement want to continue. And most people accept when they get over 60 these increased risks because they feel so good and they're just doing so well that they just accept those risks. And as long as you do it with your eyes open, then it's okay. And then you make life choices. Um, but uh, uh, most women who start hormones um, don't stop it at a time. They like to continue. She's not getting paid to be here. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm not either. So the question is, do you know that people with history of depression are as likely to go to the point of chronic depressed where they're very difficult to get close to someone? Would it make sense to recommend hormone uh, replacement therapy to that population, even if they get their program later? I'm sure they're getting it. Can I defer to the expert in the room? Women who've been depressed before are eight times more likely to get depressed in menopause than women who were not depressed before menopause. And while there may be a peak of depression symptoms around time menopause, once you go through full menopause, there's a decrease actually. You know, which is kind of consistent because if you look at folks who are very old in their, in their depression, they tend to have much lower rates than you would think, which points to maybe being resilient and moving on. Mm -hmm. Any other? Yes. Thank you. What's that? Last question. Last qu uh oh, make it a good one. Refer to the dose. In other words, if someone weighs 115 pounds and someone else weighs 200 pounds, is the 
dose that you give them the same? No. Because I mean, birth control pills usually come in one size. No, no. There's, there's. Um, so the original birth control pills had 50 micrograms of estrogen. There are 35s, 30s, 25s, 20s, and now 15s. They all have different doses. But to answer your question, it is, I mean, again, everybody does this differently, but, um, you know, if somebody's, you know, at the top of the bell tower about to shoot somebody, I start them on the highest dose because you want to get them down from the tower quickly, and then you titrate down. But if somebody's sort of not sure whether they want to be on it, you start at the lowest dose. And... Um, the, I like cooking, so I always use a food analogy. At some point, you follow the recipe, and then at some point, you taste it, and you adjust the seasoning. So that's what hormone replacement is. So you either start at the high end or the low end, and then you wait four to six weeks, and you say, where are we? And then you start you know, trading off things for things, and you figure out where you need to be. So thank you all for coming.